Uh, my name is Sharon Acabas, and it's my great honor, along with Eleanor Sterling and Aaron Betley and Molly Anderson, the organizing committee. For those of you who were not able to be with us la here last year, I just want to give you a very brief overview of how we got here, and that is because it's the brainchild of one of many, of Dr. Sterling, who does just remarkable work all over the world and sees how many of us are trying to accomplish similar things and not yet working well together. So one of the major goals we have for this community of practice is not to duplicate each other's efforts and to build on each other's shoulders and each other's work. And it's just uh, really so great to be able to work with, with all of you. And we have some thank yous for today and then a very brief introduction of where we think we're going to try to go today and moving forward and then we'll begin the program. So uh, these are not necessarily in order, they're just in order of what I'm remembering. We have Alex Sosa who behind the scenes has just helped with <laughs> tremendously He's here from the Institute of Human Nutrition and Tony Alexander is capturing this for perpetuity. Tony, thank you. Um, not here is uh, Sarah Sternglass, who helped us a lot with the website, and we will be hopefully be able to thank her at lunch. And all of you, really, we thank you tremendously for being here, and the folks who are doing the plenary and the workshops, we're just really grateful for all of the thought we see that you've already put into to the work. We hope that as we're working together today, uh, and also, I, wanna, I don't want to forget to thank our student volunteers. So, um, Rachel, Gloria, Sarah, and where's Yeji? Oh, Yeji's wa Yeji's working. <laughs> so they're going to help us or, uh, get around today. In terms of what we are trying to accomplish, as we move forward in today, and, and today's focus is going to be transforming thought into action. We want to be thinking about ways of creating enduring products that reflect the process that we're going through. So we're going to seed those ideas as we go through the day. I'm going to just take you quickly um, through the agenda and the workshop sign-up sheets will be up during the coffee break, which will be upstairs. So if you haven't yet signed up for a workshop, you're, you'll be able to do that uh, this, or soon. We're almost going to be on time, and <laughs> once we get there, we'll hear from Tom Kelly. After Tom Kelly, we'll hear from Kay Clancy. We'll take a little break, and then we'll have a panel here with Stephen Gray, Rebecca Jordan, and Tammy Long. We'll have lunch in the faculty club, which used to be the library of the university, so keep that in mind. And we'll have escorts for that lunch, and we'll come back here and begin the workshops this afternoon. At the end of the workshops, we'll reconvene in this room, think about some of the major things and themes we've learned about, and then set ourselves up for tomorrow. And then tomorrow... I'll just say two quick things. The workshops are in this building. Several of you have asked me that question. They're on different floors, but we'll let you know. When you sign up, you'll be able to mark down the <coughs> workshop location. Also, for anybody who worries about time, we, all the speakers have the same amount of time as we said, and the panels will take almost the same amount of time. We're just going to cut back on our introductions. Okay. And then, so tomorrow we'll reconvene at the workshop room. You'll have all of that information by the time you need it, we promise. And then once the two workshops in the morning are finished, we'll come back to this room review the workshops, think about lessons learned in each of the workshops, and then spend some time on moving forward, summary, and next steps. And then we have a wonderful reception uh, in an area that actually has an outdoor space here. So we hope you'll all join us for that. So I think we're, we're ready for uh, Aaron to introduce Tom. So thank you all for being here. Good morning. Good morning. So Dr. Tom Kelly is executive director of the University of New Hampshire Sustainability Institute, which he founded in 1997, and the chief sustainability officer of the university. Throughout his three decades of national and international work in higher education, Dr. Kelly has focused 
<clears throat> on sustainability as a transformative cultural force and the creative process of engaging its disruptive and inspirational dynamics in education, research, and practice. He co-edited and authored The Sustainable Learning Community, One University's Journey to the Future, a book written by more than 60 UNH faculty and staff engaged in collaborative sustainability efforts on and beyond the campus that have established UNH as one of the most innovative sustainability institutions in higher education. <clears throat> Dr. Kelly's current activities include a focus on the practice of network leadership in developing transdisciplinary approaches to sustainability challenges. He's founding convener of Food Solutions New England, a six state network working to realize a shared vision for a sustainable regional food system. He is also a collaborative designer and facilitator of the Food Solutions New England Network Leadership Institute and a founding convener of the New Hampshire Food Alliance. Dr. Kelly's talk is Food Solutions New England from connecting to aligning for collaborative action. Thank you, um, Aaron, very much. And thank you, Sharon and Eleanor and Molly for the uh, honor of being able to speak to this uh, group and this great undertaking. And it's great to see old friends and uh, meet new friends. Uh, and I have to talk to the Montana State person because my daughter got her master's degree with you. Um, so, um, okay, I, a part of my vocational um, pathology is that I always have too much to say and too many slides. And so today is no exception uh, to that. So I'll try to push through those as, as best I can and start my clock. Um, okay, one thing I wanted to say, uh, not to be nitpicky, but uh, in terms of thought and action, um, to beware of dichotomies. And so maybe think in terms of faction uh, because, in fact, thought and thinking is action, um, and it tends to get devalued uh, as if it's over here and only these tangible things count. So sort of faction, and we deal with this constantly in the network world of uh, talking and doing, so that could be, I don't know, toing, um, to, to, again, give value to uh, the power of talking and the power of thinking, especially together. Um, as Aaron said um, at the outset, my, I come at this not uh, as a food system expert, but someone who's been working in higher education, sustainability, higher ed for the last 30 years, uh, so trying to bring this big, unwieldy concept here, as opposed to the one at the top. Uh, into a uh, university landscape, and of course the only universities have, when they look in the mirror, they see cutting edge, uh, but when you're trying to change uh, universities, it turns out they're a very conservative institution. Um, so the, um, the framework and how and why we got into uh, food systems is to take this big, unwieldy idea of sustainability, which has an, an incredibly rich and detailed history, um, and principles, and uh, a lot of behind it, uh, and put it into some kind of framework that we can then put to work to uh, begin this transformation process. So this framework is what we've used for the last 20 years, it'll be 20 years next month. Um, I can't believe it, uh, since I went to the age. Uh, but anyway, the key here is we're looking at sustainability at the intersection of climate and energy, biodiversity and ecosystems, food systems, and culture. And we're concerned with sustaining the integrity of all of those systems simultaneously. So the point for this group is food, as we understand it, is a non-negotiable structural problem of sustainability. So we cannot have sustainability without sustainable food systems, but we can't have sustainable food systems ultimately without the larger conditions of sustainability. So, I feel like Jacob Marley sometimes dragging around this big framework wherever I go, I can't get rid of it. Um, the other thing I wanted to offer in terms of systems and thinking of pedagogy, uh, often we kind of very quickly bring that inside of a course or inside of a classroom, uh, but to think also about community pedagogy. And uh, in the ancient world, the idea was the polis teaches, the community teaches. We can talk about principles and commitments, but then are we practicing them at the same time consistently as an entire university community? 
So uh, our framework there is looking at these systems across the curriculum, operations, research, and engagement. This is what has guided us uh, up to now. Um, so again, we're looking to uh, transform the landscape of the institution. So I wanted to give just a quick um, set of examples uh, from the work we've done at the University of New Hampshire, and then um, spend most of the time on food solutions New England and um, some of the dynamics associated with that. Uh, but again, with food understood as a um, structural element of sustainability, we began a process of convening, and convening is essentially our daily work. Uh, it's just constantly convening, because we're trying to overcome these, these boundaries and fragmentation um, that are, are persistent and resilient. Uh, as it turns out, if you, uh, it's like the plates that are spinning around on the sticks. If you walk away, they'll fall off, and people will see that into uh, well and uh, silence. So, so I will go through the details of this, but we engaged starting back in 2000 with the Food and Society Working Group, and then all, all sorts of convenings within the campus and far away from the campus. Um, we started the New Hampshire Farm to School program uh, in 2003, and still resides uh, in our institute. We have a, a collaborative center, actually with Jennifer and her colleagues at Cornell way back in the day, uh, Farm to School. Um, we started a um, or facilitated, everything is allowed. Students are in our club. We worked with our learning services, we saw the clouds, their race. Uh, set of partners and collaborators, um, and um, it's just been great. So we looked at where we're going to get this baseline, set some targets, and the like. And then we're continuing this now two years later with the goal this year as a full stop, going to the next level of that network. Great partners. Uh, we also urge uh, a lot of people to establish a personal manager and research arm in the University of New York. I had a full head of dark hair before we took that to me. And that was one of those examples where cutting edge university was not missing. Um, and it was really um, a revelation to see how wedded uh, people were to uh, a conventional way of doing things. And, and, and how this is uh, they go into something that does not really have controversial impact, uh, but necessary. But anyway, we, we, we got through that and it was uh, up until then. In 2006, we brought a parallel journey to uh, UNH in 2003. Um, and then we convened a whole group of faculty and staff uh, while he was with us. And then out of that came a decision to develop a new undergraduate curriculum in New York astronomy, and that's in a uh, sustainable agriculture, uh, cuisine, and food entrepreneurship, and nutrition. I think you can imagine those all being really connected. Um, in the conventional, of course, uh, they just simply have their systematically separated to all of them. So that's an integrated systemic undergraduate program. It's a little bit interesting. Major nutrition offered a new major in eco gastronomy. In fact, that's what a lot of people uh, do. We also uh, did a lot of work on moving from um, a um, agronomy based um, science and animal science as, as the basis for agriculture to an agro ecosystem frame. Again, that seems just very basic. Uh, but uh, we had sort of the remnants of the old structure in place and we're down to one agronomist and a small number of animal scientists and we really and a bunch of ecologists who weren't doing anything in agriculture so there was a process again of convening and bringing people together for that let me just keep my clock on here um, and then that led to um, a whole uh, long-term uh, study led by John Aber, who was a terrestrial ecologist, a nitrogen guy who had been working in forests, um, now working on the farm uh, and, and doing really fascinating work out uh, at the organic, uh, organic dairy farm. We had a farming for the future. I should say too that back in 1997, there was a very uh, deeply held mindset that we were post-agriculture. 
and the university as cutting edge was of course not going to get its hands into antiquated uh, soils and farms that we were, you know, you, you were going to genetically engineer animals that were going to produce everything and, uh, and then of course agricultural production could migrate to where land and labor were cheaper overseas and uh, I mean it's really hard today to realize and remember just how firmly that was held. Um, and I had a, a senior administrator uh, yell across the table at me about uh, an issue around saving some farmland that we could not afford to be a museum. So um, anyway, all that has completely uh, transformed. We had this, uh, I share this, Farming for the Future, that was just such a dramatic uh, symbol of a turnaround that now we could talk about food systems and agriculture as a forward-looking uh, field and idea rather than something we're uh, distancing ourselves from. That also led to uh, a cluster hire uh, at UNH, which was a big cluster hire for a college that had been um, unable to hire for many years. Uh, and it was really a combination of um, sustainable ecosystem management and sustainable ag uh, and the like. And then uh, finally by 2010, an undergraduate major in sustainable ag and food systems. And now there's a new department that my colleague Joanne Burke uh, is a major part of. There's no slide for it yet because there's no web page, but a new department in agriculture, nutrition, and food systems. So it's, that's part of the pedagogy of, of the institution manifesting these different elements and connecting them uh, that reinforces what we can do inside of a particular course. Um, so that's why I spent the time uh, on that, okay. So I want to now uh, shift to Food Solutions New England, which is really uh, the engagement part of that curriculum operations research and engagement piece um, that uh, we started back in 2010 and in some ways has kind of taken over our lives or some of our lives um, in a good way, uh, but it, it's been an interesting ride. Um, so let me just uh, zoom in here that a part of what we're trying to do is, of course, acknowledge uh, a global and national uh, context in which we're operating, um, but then uh, zoom in on a regional scale. Uh, and this, it, this is nice to actually be paired up with, with Kate, uh, talking about two complementary regions, the Northeast and New England. Um, so we zoom in, and in, in 2010, we began asking, what could we do better together as a region than we can do just by ourselves in states or in even local communities within states? So it was a pretty straightforward uh, kind of impetus or question behind uh, that, but of course it has had cascading implications. Um, so be careful of questions that you ask even if they seem uh, simple. Um, so what I want to do is uh, share some of what's going on here with you through the lens of uh, two areas that as, as we've struggled to uh, respond to funders and others about what's the impact of this work. Uh, we can't say that this network is going to change production practices or distribution patterns in some cause and effect way. So we've had to um, think uh, really a lot about, well, what is the domain in which we're operating and trying to influence? And um, we've come to the conclusion that it's really thought leadership, so I'll say a few more words about that, and network leadership. And so that's where we've put our stake uh, in the ground, and that's the way we're uh, communicating that. And uh, fortunately, our funders are uh, supportive of that uh, idea. Related to that is the power of ideas. I just want to, I know it's obvious, but I think it's worth remembering on an ongoing basis. Ideas are powerful things. Um, and the power of trust can never be uh, overstated uh, or overestimated. It's just been central. And then the power of values and the power of alignment. So sort of the gray things of the thought side of it and the blue things are, are the network piece. So just in terms of thought leadership, in a way uh, what I talked about at UNH with uh, uh, food systems is an example of that. Just opening up a space where it's okay and legitimate to think and aspire 
uh, about something like a New England regional food system. Um, and so ju just creating that space and some context and some legitimacy uh, is really important work, but it's not tangible. It's hard to, to connect it uh, to things you can touch and, and kick. And people love to kick this work uh, because they don't think it's tangible enough. Um, but anyway, it's, it's just really important to, to open up a conversational and conceptual space uh, to, to, to let ideas take root. And then the power of ideas, uh, of course, uh, intellectual historians have been pointing out to us for a long, long time just how important ideas are. Um, and, and then values uh, of late, I don't know if people are familiar with the work coming out of the UK um, that's taken all the work in sociolinguistics and social psychology about values and frames and deep frames and uh, really put it into an operational framework for progressive nonprofits who are still operating in what they call the enlightenment model that if we just get enough data in front of people, they will reason to the proper conclusion. Uh, when in fact people are operating based on underlying values and frames and that you need to speak to those values and frames and that sometimes the issue area doesn't even matter. Uh, it's quite striking this work. So a common cause is a website, uh, not Ralph Nader's uh, common cause, but the common cause over in the UK. Uh, and there's just a, a treasure trove of reports and things associated with that. Let me just check my time here. Uh, okay, so a thought leadership uh, tangible example. Uh, one of the things that has come out of uh, Food Solutions New England is a New England food vision, uh, which looks out to 2060 and says, we could or can we produce up to 50% of the food that we consume in New England uh, here in New England, uh, and do it in a way that is healthy food for all, sustainable fishing and farming, and thriving communities. So it's a big vision, a big idea. The values uh, that it's committed to are quite explicit. Um, Molly was a co-author of that, Joanne Burke a co-author, I was a co-author, uh, and many others. Uh, so it's been a very interesting uh, process. And I thought I would share just a little bit of how this idea has seeded uh, in different places. So I gave a presentation to one of our core funders yesterday, the Kendall Foundation, so I thought I would start with this, uh, which is a website uh, for philanthropy, uh, which did this story on thinking big and bold, how the Kendall Foundation is transforming uh, the New England food system. This is from the New England Grassroots Environmental Fund, a, a different kind of foundation, but again, they've hitched up to uh, the New England food vision. This is the Sustainable Business Network of Massachusetts, and our um, colleague Karen Spiller, who's also here, is doing a workshop, uh, has done an amazing job of being an ambassador and connecting. Uh, and so SBN, within their, their vision and values, explicitly call out uh, the New England food vision as, as part of what guides uh, their work. Um, uh, NISOG, the Northeast Sustainable Ag Working Group, um, long time network across the, the um, nine state uh, region, um, uh, has also keyed into that. Uh, Resilience, which comes out of the Post Carbon Institute, um, has uh, called this out as, as being part relevant to the whole idea of resilience on a regional scale. Uh, National Center for Appropriate Technology and their agricultural effort um, has called this out. The Muskie School of public service, um, and actually um, University of Southern Maine has, is starting a new food, uh, food system effort. We've, it's been picked up in the press, um, a, a headline that we loved, uh, New England and the Food Summit, Inclusion and Dignity for All, which was one of the underlying core values that we're committed to. Uh, the Boston Globe Editorial Board uh, wrote this, New England deserves a regional food plan, and that was based on, uh, in dialogue with this vision uh, idea that had come out. Uh, this is some of the work that Karen's done, a little TV coverage of uh, some work in Western Mass that's explicitly referencing that. This I thought was interesting from the Providence Rhode Island Journal. It was a story on Johnson and Whale students using underutilized species, scup, uh, in their cooking. And then as you read through the article, one of the students said, the goal, she said, is to have 50% of the food coming from local sources by 2060. So it's just 
is great to kind of see it uh, buried in there. Uh, UMass group looks to um, see how New England can produce half its food by 2060. Uh, this uh, terrible slide, but uh, Nicole, I told you about this, but I just wanted to put it up there to say, this is a, a National Science Foundation a proposal that uh, went in not too long ago. Um, and it's um, integrated uh, food, energy, and water systems. Uh, so again, it's using the vision uh, as an explicit context and a scenario for research uh, for an NSF uh, proposal. And then our friends at Farm to Institution New England, which is a six-state effort of, uh, that grew out of the Farm to School movement, um, again, in their vision uh, explicitly referencing um, the New England food vision. Uh, and then this um, penultimate one I wanted to call out, NASDA is the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, which are all the commissioners or secretaries of ag that meet every year. And in 2014, Chuck Ross was the, then the uh, secretary of ag in Vermont, and so they chaired that meeting. So that was people from all over the country coming together. And uh, Chuck and uh, a bunch of us and funders all got together uh, quickly raised $30,000 and made Food Solutions New England a diamond sponsor of the NASDA meeting. So what did that mean? Well, we had a delegation of six of us, and we were in the little um, suite with uh, lovely wine and food with uh, people from DuPont and Syngenta and Archer Daniels Midland and Monsanto, and, because they're the ones that normally fund at the diamond level. And so it was a real eye-opener, and what part of what Chuck was saying was that this local and regional sustainable food system voice was completely absent from this annual national meeting. So it was, uh, it was a really interesting outcome, and I should say, just as a little epilogue, that um, Sassafras, the National Sustainable Ag Funders, Ag and Food Funders, they're called Sassafras for some reason, based out in Santa Barbara, Virginia Clark, Anyway, they, we made a set of recommendations after this that they should make this an annual uh, line item in their budget. And so now, uh, since 2014, groups like Food Solutions New England from the region wherever they're meeting are part, they, they're, they're a sponsor and they're part of the conversation. So that's been great uh, to see and still a lot of work to do. And then uh, finally, um, this is hot off the presses last month. Um, the state of Rhode Island has issued their first formal uh, food plan uh, under the leadership of their governor, and it explicitly references the, the 50 by 60. So this is just some a little flavor of the power of an idea uh, and how it can take root and create a context to shape actions by all kinds of different people. Um, let's keep an eye on this. Um, Okay, so that was the thought leadership side. So now I want to talk a little bit about the, the network side um, and, uh, and the, the power of trust and the power of alignment. This is a book that people have been reading of late. Um, the, the visual metaphor is a little mechanical, but, um, but the ideas in it and the examples in it are quite good. Um, and it's all about networks and the importance of networks. Uh, this is another... Uh, just framework that we use uh, pretty regularly about connectivity, bringing people together, connecting them, building trust, um, and then aligning around values and visions. Uh, and then that supports, sometimes production is the, is the word at the top, uh, or action. Uh, but that's essentially, we're constantly circling through this. Uh, I tried to come up with a visual that could put a wheel around that and have it roll, but I haven't worked that out. So um, part of what we did, uh, we kicked this off with uh, a convening, not surprisingly, of uh, in 2011, we convened the first New England uh, Food Summit. And so out of that Food Summit came, one, uh, a early version of the Food Vision, a very early uh, version from our colleague Brian Donahue at Brandeis, was a historian and a farmer and somebody had, who had been part of our convenings back in 2000. He had been at work on this idea of a vision that was, uh, I should say, for the biodiversity uh, people, uh, which were all biodiversity people. Um, they, it was preceded by something called Wildlands and Woodlands, 
that called for 70% um, forest cover permanent in New England. Right now we're at about 80% forest cover. But they made a vision and a goal to say we, we should keep New England 70% forest cover for all of the, the ecological and cultural benefits associated with that. So this food vision of 50 by 60 explicitly honors that 70% forest cover. So it's not about clear cutting uh, the forests and, and growing food, but really kind of integrating uh, those two ideas. So we came out of that first summit with people saying, we want to hear more about this vision, a little more detail, and we want to keep meeting. Um, and so we committed to move these uh, summits around the region in each state. So uh, we've, and we've done that um, along the way. We just completed last a year ago the sixth uh, summit in Connecticut. So they've moved around the state. Um, six of those, somewhere around 800 delegates have been part uh, of that process. We built a network team of um, collaborative partners from around the six state region that have been meeting on an ongoing basis very intensely, designing the network, clarifying uh, the values and the like. Along the way, uh, in 2013, at our third summit, we made a very uh, public and um, sincere commitment to put racial equity at the center of our work. And that was a really uh, watershed uh, moment for this network because we were a predominantly white, uh, very privileged white uh, network with great uh, beliefs and commitments. And uh, we collectively woke up to what a lot of us already knew but put it explicitly in. And that was another interesting period uh, where people would sort of look and say, what does that have to do with food? Um, and, um, you know, it's more of this fragmentation. I mean, really good people who personally believe in racial equity would say, uh, one person said, aren't you taking your eye off the ball here by, uh, by doing that? So, again, systems, you know, what's in and what's out. Uh, is really important. So Karen Spiller is here, and she's one of our three ambassadors, which is one of the ways we've operationalized this, uh, working in the three um, southern New England states um, to just be an ambassador out uh, into all communities, but uh, communities of color in particular. Uh, Meryl Moore is a state senator um, in Connecticut, and Julius Kolawali heads the African Alliance in, in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. So that's been a really important part of empowering them to go out and help us be more inclusive, and they've had a huge uh, impact. Um, um, this is just the structure, so I'll skip over that for now, but there is a structure of a backbone and these various teams. Uh, Molly and I were talking, I just wanted to say, not to try to read this, I haven't figured out a way to really characterize this, but the value of people's time that has been put into this is enormous. And so there's clearly something of value, otherwise they would not stick with it. And um, particularly for funders, I'd like to find a way to characterize it um, because it's enormous um, the, what's, what people have uh, put in. So what we have now is six states across New England all have state food system planning efforts established, underway, and they have backbone organizations uh, that are supporting them, and those backbone organizations have formed a community of practice, apropos to this, that are coming together and communicating and learning just like we're doing here. So, uh, so it's, it's wonderful to see that that has happened, and so they're in dialogue with one another, because New England states, if you don't know New England states, can never be the same as each other. They're all utterly unique. And so you have to make provision for that. Um, so, the, so we've got a community of practice. Um, and so they're talking to each other, but they're also in dialogue with this larger regional vision. And so that's, that's what the, the, the goal is. Um, so uh, in terms of the network piece of this and building trust, we've used a delegation model. And one of the ways that that's been advantageous is we've identified missing perspectives and said, okay, we're gonna create a delegation to bring into the next summit. So this is um, a, a colleague of ours, Abel Luna from Vermont, who came in in an emerging leaders uh, delegation, uh, and he's part of an organization in Vermont called Migrant Justice, 
which is really looking at uh, the, mostly the people working on dairy farms who are largely invisible um, in, uh, in the system. And some of, not all of the dairy farmers uh, are uh, doing the wrong thing, but some are, and, and many are doing the right thing. But that voice was really missing, so Bell has come in and he arrived as emerging leader, and now he's just a leader. He's, he's just really um, helped all of us. Um, this was an emerging leader retreat that they asked for, that they, they wanted to get together from around the region, so we supported that uh, to help them build the kind of um, connectivity that they wanted. This is from our sixth summit in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut, and there's a bell who's, you know, a full, like I say, a full-fledged leader within the network team. Uh, and everything else. This was our most diverse summit. Um, and this is a great image. This is uh, Marilyn Moore, one, again, one of our ambassadors and the state senator. Um, and you see the 50 by 60 there and just uh, a wonderful gathering of people. But this is what she said um, in reflecting back on the summit. She said, this family did not exist before. Everyone was doing things individually, but now they're mobilized and working together, moving Bridgeport Food Policy Council uh, along, they've asked me, that's Marilyn, to be an advisor where before I couldn't even get a seat. Uh, four people who are at the summit are now on the Food Policy Council, and now that council is making stuff happen. So again, we convened, we couldn't predict that something like this was going to flow from it, but it's the kind of stuff, that sometimes people call it network effects, uh, but that sounds a little technical. Um, so, um, okay, sorry. I'm shooting for 40 minutes total, right? Okay. okay, so it's just connecting people who hadn't been connected, the kind of conversations uh, that we can have. Um, the, um, the, the leadership that has come out of this, um, Issa, who was one of the trailblazers, so that's what I wanted to underscore here. Karen and her two colleague ambassadors uh, began recruiting five uh, delegates from their work from each of the states they're in to come to the summit. And they've had an, a huge impact. Um, and this is just some of them uh, who have come to the summit. Uh, Anna is from uh, Springfield who runs the gardening program there. But Issa has, has become a kind of um, a perfect embodiment of what the effort is um, he has, he's a, uh, really a racial justice organizer in Connecticut and is now using food as his vehicle. And um, he's just on fire, uh, is all I can say, and taking a major leadership role uh, in everything we're doing. So that this ambassador work has really uh, brought so much value and inclusion into this network. And we still have a long way to go. Um, one of the things that uh, Joanne Burke and Karen and uh, others in, in the network have done is put together this 21-day racial equity challenge, and some of you here may have uh, participated in that, but it's, it's uh, a variation on this idea of habit-forming uh, behavior over 21 days. And so this is based in food, uh, the food system context, but bringing in the whole question of racial equity and food justice uh, and it started, I think, the first year where there are 200 people that signed up, and this year, 1,300 uh, people signed up and participated, and our sense is many more than that actually participated, but formally 1,300 people uh, signed up for that. So the ongoing capacity building, if you will, of the whole network to meaningfully bring this issue of racial equity to the heart of our work. Um, and so that's been uh, significant. Uh, we uh, all just collaborated on a, on a um, um, article, Equity is Common Cause, uh, that came out in this new journal out of the Haas Institute at UC Berkeley. Um, uh, it's called Othering and Belonging, and it's a really interesting kind of non-conventional uh, journal. And um, so anyway, we were, we were very um, happy and proud to, to have that in there. Uh, and then uh, the other piece uh, is we uh, kind of spontaneously started uh, this Network Leadership Institute. Uh, leadership had been something that we had clearly uh, identified, uh, and then we had an opportunity and we created it, not fully knowing uh, what impact it would have. And as we were talking earlier today, 
These are um, a cohort of uh, 18, three from each of the six New England states. Um, and uh, it's turned out to be a brilliant idea that we didn't really have as a brilliant idea. Uh, but it, it, it basically is the way to grow a network in a really uh, effective way because they, this group uh, is together for uh, the next one, three two and a half day sessions. They have completely bonded. They're completely grounded in Food Solutions New England vision and values. And they've gotten a facilitative leadership and network leadership uh, skill building along the way. And they fit, even before they finished, they said, we want in to Food Solutions New England. We want to lead. And so uh, it's just been amazing. Um, and so fortunately, we got funding and we're doing it again uh, this, this coming year. And I hope we can run it at least five times. Uh, and out of that would come really the future of this whole network. Um, so now, last but not least, I wanted to say a few words about systems mapping. But the reason I waited so long to get to this is the systems mapping is, in some ways, there was a lot of appetite for systems mapping. When are we going to get to action? And I just want to point out how much action I've tried to, to uh, illustrate here prior to any systems mapping. So it's not to devalue systems mapping, but it's, it's also to recognize if you build relationships and trust and connectivity and alignment, all kinds of things happen. All kinds of action happens that you can't predict. Uh, but if you're rooted in explicit values, uh, then you can trust that what happens, even though you can't predict it, is going to be uh, aligned and consistent. Um, so we did this systems mapping exercise. I'm not going to try to go through it in detail, but a few um, uh, images just to point out. It began with a behavior over time graph, really based on just who was in the room. Is this, is we did this here and said, OK, how did we end up with the food system that we have now? And people pooled their knowledge and put together various elements that they felt uh, had resulted in a precipitous decline in the percent of food in New England that's produced in New England. Uh, what were some of the factors associated with that? And what might it take to get to this, this goal of 2050? So that then we had um, consultants who sort of went away and um, smoked something, or I'm not sure, <laughs> and they, they started to analyze this and cluster ideas or themes. Um, and then they, they sort of underscored those, and that then formed the basis of people that were identified and interviewed around the region, people in these various areas of wages, of distribution, of all the various elements. It was, it was months uh, of effort. And then that uh, kind of brought us to this, um, this um, I don't know if I want to call it conclusion, but this framework, which basically said, OK, we've got that vision up in the top left. We want to build a clear understanding and collaborative relationships across the region. That's, so we're going to look at these so-called leverage areas of mobilizing people for action, cultivating and connecting leadership, making a business case and linking knowledge and narrative to influence these core dynamics of the system, which were identified as democratic empowerment, a new food story or a new food narrative, and this, which is essentially sustainable food economies. Um, and, uh, and so what I really want to underscore here is that democratic empowerment was a big uh, threshold to get across uh, because the language of the food system had not been incorporating political language. It was about fragmentation and it was about connectivity, you know, systems language, but nobody was saying, you know, we need a democratic food system. That, that was getting marginalized. But here finally it broke through and said the process of democratic empowerment is fundamental if we're going to achieve what this is about. We have to start to speak to people, not simply as consumers, but as people with political agency. And, and this was all before the election, all before the election. Um, and then that core value of dignity kind of hanging right at the center there. So then, of course, because nobody wants to look at that kind of uh, graph, we uh, did our best, and this was very controversial within the network. Um, some people call it a Richard Scarry drawing, and uh, it's too simplistic, nobody will respect us, and at the same time we're trying to make it accessible to everybody, so it's a sort of pathway, and we've used this, and 
One of the uh, fishermen uh, from Rhode Island told us that she very proudly blew this up, enlarged it, I mean, and put it on her boat. Um, so, um, so anyway, so th this is where we've ended up, and we've just come out uh, of a, um, um, a swashbuckling two-day meeting on Monday and Tuesday. Molly was there, Joanne was there, Karen couldn't make it, but um, where we said, okay, we're going to now come together and name uh, some of these strategies. So here's where we're going as of now forward. The new food narrative is going to put out a request for proposals to bring in a consultant to work with the network, really using the social science of, of deep frames and framing. So this is not just marketing and messaging. This is really speaking to those values that I was referring to earlier uh, and the power of values and narrative uh, strategies. Uh, we agreed on uh, doing a state of the New England food system report, a kind of high level dashboard that will uh, require a lot of work, but uh, it will increase the transparency of the system if it's successful, and where transparency is increased, accountability. Is that my timer? Or is that, I'm, I'm putting the room to sleep? <laughs> right, yeah. Um, I, I've got my, my clock going here. Um, tracking trends, and not just uh, quantitative data, but qualitative uh, as well. It's, it's a big thing, but everybody, again, aligned around this as uh, going forward. And then something we're referring to as a New England Farm, Fisheries, and Food Bill, which is essentially a big vehicle to think policy and the policy pathways, not just at the federal level, but at the federal, state, and local level, uh, and to kind of put it together under this rubric of, of a bill to be thinking policy and legislation. So um, that's another piece of it. And then related to that is something we're calling the People's Guide to the New England Food Vision, which gets back to the speaking to the political agency of people and mobilizing people, partially inspired by the indivisible um, guide and movement that's uh, taken off uh, around the country. And, and one of the pieces here was the group said, we want to take this bill, these policy pathways, and merge it with the People's Guide so that we don't get another policy report that's beautiful work that's sitting on a shelf somewhere. So we want to merge these two things so that they're, it's, it's owned by a lot of people who are mobilized um, for action. Um, and then strategic convening um, around some key issues in the region. New England dairy is a huge issue because of the land, uh, farmland, um, 70, some 75% of the far active farmland is under dairy farms. And we're losing dairy farms uh, still at a very rapid rate. Fisheries and other uh, key issues, uh, and looking at uh, tensions in the system. So my final uh, slide then is just, of course, we have to return to the Venn diagram because they're all interconnected, uh, and we're going to be refining these now uh, as we go forward, and by the fall, bring those back to the network team in a fleshed-out version with budgets attached to them um, to take it forward. So I'll stop there. Thank you.